Hey everybody, and welcome back to the sixth and final episode of the Northern Snakehead Truth Series. Now, as with the other videos, I want to keep this intro very short so we can get straight to the interview. In today's episode, we're going to cover, is there a path, and if so, what is that path to Northern Snakehead achieving game fish status, as well as what type of fish we should harvest. And again, that's going to apply to species beyond snakehead. But it's going to be very germane to Snakehead as well, and I'll get into more of that at the end of this video. And again, if you haven't seen the earlier parts in this series, definitely go back and check them out. We've covered a lot of ground. A lot of ground. And the one I always reiterate is, number one, the first video will tell you who John Odenkirk is, why you should consider him an authoritative voice on the topic of Northern Snakehead. And two... The fact that thus far, based on the evidence from the studies conducted thus far, there's no evidence to support northern snakehead being labeled invasive. By the definition which says, causes ecological, biological, or economic harm. They, are, they do fit the federal definition, but the federal definition says, may cause harm, which is <laughs> an open-ended definition to say the least. So, I'll stop right there. Let's get to the discussions about snakehead, game fish status, and what types of fish we should harvest. So hypothetically, if we as fishermen wanted to take it upon ourselves, before the regulations catch up, <coughs> if we wanted to take it upon ourselves to responsibly manage this resource, like as a game fish, like when you're bass fishing, you don't want to go out and catch 12 inch bass all day. You depend and maybe you do. Well, maybe, maybe a slot limit. Well, yes, but what I'm saying like, you, if you wanted to like design a fishery for fisheries management, Generally speaking, like for, for, at least from my perspective, maybe other people will think about it differently. I love to go out and catch those three, four, five pounders. Right. Like I would rather do that than go to a pond that has just overloaded with 12 or 14 or 15 inch fish. Right. So hypothetically, if we wanted to tailor our harvest, how, like, what kind of snakehead we're keeping to support the development of the species sports <laughs> game fishing, what, was, what does that fisheries management look like? Well, I think there's some people in Richmond would be quite upset if I okay, explained you, to you the no, formula no, no, for no, how no, to no, increase. No, no. No, That's all right. But, but, but I, what I can tell you, you in is that, well, you, you know, you give a really good example because in certain scenarios, you want what we call a predator heavy or bass heavy situation. Mm -hmm. where, where, where's the better place to take a kid fishing, right? Yeah, that's true. That's so true. you can throw that plug out and there's like three bass, three 12 inch bass beating each other up to try to get it. Yep. That's what that's what makes a kid want to go fishing. That's true. Um, now, for an experienced angler, you know, no, they don't want that. That's not their top choice. But that's well, that's why we try to have a diversity of management philosophies on different waters. And, and so, when you ask about which, which essentially what you're asking about is what the end fisherman dubbed years and years ago, a selective harvest. Yes. Okay. Which is a very wise uh, philosophy, and, and it's something that should be followed. I, I think. I mean, I'm. I like to eat some of what I catch. I, I like fish. I'm the, I'm the same way. Not, right. not everything. I let go right. a lot, but I'm the same way. So I think it's, and in some cases, you actually help a population out by a certain amount of harvest. And what I tell people is usually no matter what species or, or what the water, it's fairly intuitive if you look at the size structure of what you're catching. And you generally want to cull what's the most abundant. So if you're catching a ton of 12-inch bass, keep some of those little bass. I mean, you're going to help the population out. If, if you're catching fish X, and you're catching a ton of, you know, 18 to 20 inch fix X and, and not much smaller or bigger, then keep some of that size. You know, don't don't keep the really big ones, don't keep the really small ones, unless there's a ton of really small ones, and then keep the small ones. Just 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 take the, the size that seems to be stockpiled. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times with bass, you know, they'll stockpile at different sizes in different waters, just based on, on the habitat and the, the forage base. Now, involved with this conversation right here about harvest is something I was going to make a video on myself about, but since I'm talking to a fisheries biologist here, right? bioaccumulation. Right. How should bioaccumulation, well, actually, first of all, let's touch on what bioaccumulation is and right. how it's relevant to what kind of fish and what size fish we harvest. Right. So bioaccumulation, we're talking about the, the, uh, the tendency of, of compounds, whether they're uh, toxic or not, to accumulate in the tissues of an organism. In this case, it's a fish. And a lot of times it's in the fatty tissues. Uh, it could be in the liver. It could be in different components of the body. Uh, and as, as you go up the food chain and it go up in the size, typically these accumulations are more and more and more. Uh, and that's why we have health advisories on certain consumption of different species. And for instance, the Potomac River, you're not supposed to eat carp or channel catfish over a certain size or blue catfish over a certain size. And that's based on testing that's been done by various Department of Health, DEQ, 
typically partnership will go out and, and a lot of times we'll get uh, the tissue for them and then they'll have it tested. And then they'll come back in consultation and say, this is our recommendation based on these EPA guidelines that you should not eat certain you know portions or if you're a pregnant woman or you're nursing, whatever the case is. Um, so we have done that with DEQ and VDH for snakeheads because snakeheads are good to eat and a lot of people like to eat them and they're now Excellent. legal for Excellent. Com- <laughs> not, <laughs> legal for, for commercial sale in Virginia. Yep. Um, and so we've done for years. In fact, there was a paper at the symposium on that. It was a, it was a poster, on it. not a paper, but a poster. Um, DEQ basically has determined the snakeheads are pretty damn safe. Um, what, surprisingly enough, because typically fish that are really high on the food chain tend to bioaccumulate higher levels of exactly. PCBs or mercury or things like that. But whatever it is, maybe it's that they're so shallow and they're eating very small fish a lot or they're eating younger fish or they're growing so fast. I'm not maybe accumulation of all these different things plus some others. I'm not exactly sure what it is. But the bottom line is we've repeatedly tested and all except for the biggest of snakeheads. It was the only one, it was Doe Creek and the very largest, like over 600 millimeters, which is, you know, that's 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 getting up there pretty good size. That's probably a 10 pound snake hit. Um, only those, and those only had like a, a minimum of a couple of meals a month. You could still eat them, but you just weren't supposed to eat a lot of them. And that's the case with a lot of these. And the other thing is these recreational guidelines are set really, really conservatively. So I tell people, I'm like, you know, you really don't need to be worried about you know, eating a, a few meals, you know, of this fish from this water. I mean, it's, if it's your primary source of protein, sometimes you go across a bridge in Alexandria and you'll see these little huddles of people and with hand lines and they're down there and they're there every day. Oh yeah. And they're catching those fish oh, yeah. and that's their primary source of protein. And those, those people might be eating those fish, those bullheads, you know, from, from four mile run every day for 20 years. Well, you're probably gonna have elevated cancer risk from that. Yep. Uh, but we're not talking about that generally. You know, we're talking about sporadic, you know, eat a few moose. And, and that's even in waters that are listed. Most of the waters that we're talking about aren't even listed. Uh, and so snakeheads are in terms of bioaccumulating, and usually it's PCBs are the concern, um, not not really a concern for snakeheads. So, so that's a good thing. Snakehead fishermen, people who love snakehead, they want to know what do we do as fishermen to try to encourage the authorities, the department's natural resources, the local governments to move the snakehead into a conventional game fish species. Like, how do we get to the point where we start adding creel limits, we start adding size limits? I don't know if you can't comment on this from your position for where you work, but in t- in t- if you can't, in-, in terms of what should the fishermen do? Because, you know, representative democracy, we express our opinions, express our desires to the elected leaders. Can you comment? And what would you say if you could? Well, sure, I can comment. Okay. It- it's a delicate situation just because... We don't necessarily want to promote snakeheads at this point, as I said, because it's there's still an unknown. Yep. And with an unknown becomes a fear. And many people are still very, very fearful. They some people equate snakeheads to, to feral hogs and the damn and again, the feral hogs have demonstrated to cause damage. Oh yeah. You can put a dollar sign with Absolutely. the damage that's done. So that that's the difference. But what has to happen? What's going what's to have to happen is continue. The status quo is going to have to be maintained. In other words, no damage shown as yep. the snakehead continues to expand its range. And we're talking about the northern snakehead here, which is the primary one in, in the U.S. As, as they continue to expand their range in which they could colonize much of the U.S., uh, their, their habitat suitabilities are in line with, with that based on their native range. But I've had requests from anglers for creel limits because they've seen the, the peak. People aren't catching as many. Now, again, this past year, I think I heard from some anglers that they, they did, their catches not were up where they were 2012, 2013, but they were up. People were screaming about it. Probably the worst, I think, was probably about 2016. People were really upset because the snakehead numbers, were. they had a couple bad years for recruitment. Uh, they hit that, that, that sort of initial peak, which I saw the invasion peak, uh, and they sort of settled into some sort of an equilibrium. Um, in context with, you know, the, the carrying capacity of these systems. And, and really, people were upset. I, I mean, talking about anglers. Um, and, and I said, look, I, it's, it's going to take a long time for that sort of institutional change to occur at the upper levels of the bureaucracy, you know, before we're even considering. I wasn't even considering talking. I was just trying to get a category forward as a state record fish, which Maryland has even done. Yeah. Um, and a citation just to recognize, you know, well, this is a big one. And so to, to give some education for people. And I haven't been able to get that yet uh, through. Hopefully soon it will be. But but even but that's even to me a very small 
uh, accomplishment, if you want to call it that, in, in terms of I'm not I'm not even talking about labeling a game fish or a sport fish yet. I mean, we're talking decades before that will be accepted. I think by many uh, regular regulators and, and uh, people that manage our nat- different natural resources. Um, but it, it, the difficult situation is that in addition to conserving our natural resources, we are in the business of making fishermen happy because we want anglers. We want people to fish. If your anglers aren't happy, they don't buy licenses. Well, then we're out of business. Yep. <laughs> so, so, so we're in a difficult situation. It's sort of like managing a deer herd, right? You know, you, the deer cause problems, but if we don't have deer hunters, we're in a world of hurt. Um, similar thing with the snakeheads and, and trying to manage that. And, and so, you know, all I've been trying to do this whole time is just tell the truth about what we're seeing and, and is, you know, and try to represent the best of my abilities, w- what the fish is, what its tendencies have been, what it, they might be, and, and what's really happening in the water. Right? And, and it, I mean, to me, it's, uh, I'd, be, you know, I'd be negligent if I wasn't doing it. And uh, well, on that note, I appreciate all your work. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, it's fantastic to have you out there studying the species because that's the only way we're going to get there is to have the evidence to back it up. Right. W- whichever way the evidence leads us. All right. I, I think it might be it. All right. All right. Good. I appreciate the time. Man. Yeah, well, my pleasure, man. Good to meet you finally. Oh, yeah, you too. I'm trying to get this done. I know, which we were exchanging emails for probably a month and a half or yeah. two months or something now, trying to get this lined up, and we finally did it. <laughs> Sense of accomplishment. So, folks, I've had a great time making this series. I've been extremely busy, and I'm very tired. But I've had a great time making this series. I truly love these fish, and if you look back through the series, through the links, the video description, everything else, my primary goal hasn't been to advocate for these fish, at least not to the exclusion of being objective with the evidence. That's been one of my primary goals, is to give you all the information you need to make an educated decision on your own. Now, with that being said, this is the part where I'm going to be speaking. I'm not speaking on behalf of John or anyone else. This is just me speaking. So I want to make that point clear. Where we're at with Snakehead right now is a lot of people are still in the grips of the hysteria, the media sensationalism, the idea that these Snakehead are monsters, that they're voracious, that they're just killing everything they can. And if you've watched the series, you know the evidence does not bear that out. They're excellent parents. They are fantastic game fish. They are admittedly fantastic table fare. They're just incredible, incredible fish. Hands down, my favorite fish to chase. But here's the point I'm driving at. For right now, this is our fishery. And what do I mean by that? I mean that other established species, other non-native established species like largemouth bass, for example, have regulations applied to their harvest. That things like creel limits, none of that exists on northern snakehead. So that's what I mean by saying this is our fishery. We can essentially, within the law, we can essentially decide how we shape and develop this fishery. Me personally, I think they're an excellent game fish. And especially if the evidence continues to bear out that they are not causing harm, then at the very least, we should stop these kill missions that people are going on. If they're not causing harm, there's no need to go out, demonize, and kill all these fish, especially when they have so much potential as a game fish. So all of us have a question to answer, and this is on each of us to decide. What do we want this fishery to be? For instance, and I'm going to make an analogy here. As a fisherman, and there may be exceptions, but as a fisherman, generally speaking, do you want to go out and catch a lot or even a few small largemouth bass? Or would you like to go out to a fishery that's been properly managed to produce trophy size largemouth? You want to go out and catch a bunch of dinks? Or do you want to go out and catch four, five, six pounders and bigger? For me, that answer is pretty clear. I like catching big fish and a lot of them. That, that's my preference, but <laughs> if that is our goal with snakehead, and I think as more people get to experience the fishery, that's going to become the goal. We have to conduct ourselves accordingly because these fish in the coming years are going to be getting a lot of pressure. They're going to become more and more popular. And if everyone out there is catching and killing them, you're going to see these fisheries go down quickly. 
you're not going to be catching as many, and you certainly won't be as big. Because people have a tendency to want to keep and kill the big breeders. Those big breeders are large because they have the characteristics necessary to make them successful in their environment. Those who are not well adapted to their environment die. Those who are well adapted live on, with the obvious exception of us harvesting them. We are the apex predators. And not to be too cliche, but, you know, to quote <laughs> Ben Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. It's on us as fishermen to be good stewards of the environment that we love, to be good stewards of the species that we love. And to do that, the best way I know how is to look at the evidence and then from there, we each have to weigh our own individual priorities. It's our fishery. What happens to Snakehead from this point forward is on us. And again, to be clear, adhere to the law. I'm not here to tell you to break the law. That's not what I'm here for. But you do have the option to release Snakehead back into the waters in which you caught them. And if you want to have great days on the water, if you want to go out there and catch a bunch of Snakehead, if you want to go out there and catch big snakehead, that will not happen if we continue on the path of catch and kill. It just won't. In the future, I'm going to continue to put out information as I receive it. I have a lot of projects coming out, or that are a lot of projects in the works for interviews on both snakehead and other species, because being a responsible steward of the environment as fishermen, is something that's really important to me. It's something I truly believe in. So whatever I can do to further that end and help others have access to the information to make their own informed decisions, that's what I'm going to do. All right. So I know that got really serious there, <laughs> but we're a growing community. Snakehead fishermen are a growing community, and we're passionate about these fish. And I can pretty much guarantee for the vast majority of people out there, as you go snakehead fishing, you're going to become part of that community. And it's up to us and how we maintain it. All right. So on that note, here comes some video clips and a lot of photos from people who are in that snakehead community out there who have gone out, caught these fish and found a new passion within the world of fishing. Uh, final note, final note. <laughs> We've done great up to this point in the comment section with being cordial to one another, even where we have disagreements. And that's great. Like, I don't want to be part of creating a war between catch and release fishermen, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen. It's not productive. I hate drama. I'm pretty sure most of you do too. Let's talk cordially with one another. Let's base our arguments on the logic and the evidence, the best information we have at hand. And let's arrive at a solution that balances the priorities of, you know, the various groups out there. And there, I'll stop. Thanks much for watching, everybody, and y'all have a good one. Ooh, that was him. Got him. one, but it's not as big as the one you lost. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs>